All right. Well, it's uh, 7 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get rolling. Um, first off, I want to thank everybody for taking some time tonight to hop on this conference call. I know this is kind of a new thing we're doing here. Um, hopefully, we're going to have some good conversation and talk about crew leadership and crew leaders and all that. First off, my name is Travis Vickerson. I've uh, been in the industry 18 years now. Um, Vice President of Operations for a tree care company in New England um, with three different branches spread across two different states, roughly about 100 personnel within the operational aspect of the company. Um, ran a company of my own for a number of years, also worked 17 years in fire rescue um, in Durham, North Carolina, and left that career, so have a little bit of experience in this. Um, also have quite a bit of experience training for treestuff.com as well as TCIA and ISA and speaking at conferences on leadership and doing motivational talks. So we're going to have a great time through these next 30 minutes. We're going to cover some topics and have some question and answer. If at any point you have a question, uh, make sure you hit star six. Let me know you have a question. I'll get to you. Um, you're going to be, everybody's going to be muted until I click on you to answer your question, and then they'll unmute you so you can ask your question. Then I'm going to remute you again um, and make sure we, everybody can hear perfectly. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and hop on in this. Um, so first of all, we understand is what is a crew leader? For most companies, a crew leader or crew foreman is that individual that we expect to go out and make sure things are done with the crew on a day-in and day-out basis. Most times, that person is picked because either they're A, they're the senior person in the company or the crew, or because they're the climber or the worker that's aloft or may have the most experience. But we don't always pick the best people for a leadership position just because they had the most time with the company. And that's one of the big fail areas I see with a lot of companies is they're just picking people that have had the most experience when they're not necessarily a leader. And we need to look at you know, being a leader. And right now we're seeing this huge vacuum in the industry of lack of leadership training and lack of born leaders, I call them. Um, and a lot of it, I think, comes down to if we went back 20, 30 years in the tree care industry, World War II had ended, Korea had ended, and we had a lot of workforce that had military experience, and the military trains you in indoctrination of being an officer, and it trains you in non-commissioned officers on how to lead, and how to lead in a crew-type mentality of, of the military. So as we've gone further and further away from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and those kind of conflicts, we're not seeing a huge increase in our workforce being veterans. So because of this, we're not seeing that natural leadership come into companies, and we're failing at sometimes at making new leaders and success about that. It's one of the frustrations that almost every company has is about crew leaders. Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they doing this? Why don't they do it this way? And for you company owners out there that are struggling with this, I can tell you one of the biggest frustrations you're going to have is holding on to that rope. Um, no different than in rigging. Sometimes you've got to let it run. When you have a crew leader out there, you need to let them run. You need to empower them. You need to let them know to be empowered and that you trust them to make the decisions. And that's why you need to make sure we're picking people that are good crew leaders but aren't just always the most experienced people. So how do we empower them? You know, that's one of the things I get asked a lot is how do you get your people empowered? First of all, we need to start viewing crew leaders differently. For a long time, our crew leader has been viewed as this position that isn't really a manager but is expected to treat their people as a manager. My whole philosophy at the crew leader position is that fundamentally they are a manager. They are a first-line manager. In oper you, know, you have most companies, you've got a crew foreman or a crew leader. Then you have got a shop foreman or an office foreman or however your structure is going forth from there all the way up to CEO and there's different levels of management. Your crew leader is a manager, and we need to treat them as such. We've got to understand that they're going to have failures. There's going to be times where they don't do it the way we want them to do it, and it's okay. You need to expect that, actually. Um, that's part of the growing process, part of the learning process. And when there's a failure, one of the things that I find fundamental is, generally speaking, when we have a failure, it's one of two things that have occurred. Either A, we as the employer or the owner, operations manager, or the person above the crew leader, however your company is structured, have failed to give them the proper guidance, have failed to give them the proper education how to do their job, or B, they've just made a bad decision, and bad decisions happen. Unfortunately, in our industry, uh, bad decisions can sometimes lead to loss of life and serious injury. So we have to make sure any time we have a bad decision made that we look at it and figure out why it happened, what can we do different, what can we learn from it. But one of the big fundamental areas is we've got to stop blaming our crew leaders for making bad decisions without looking at ourselves first. We fundamentally have to start looking at how we are approaching our crew leaders, how we are 
embodying them, empowering them, how we're uh, letting them know what we expect from them in order to get the right results that we're looking for. And the way we do that is by creating process. So going back to what I said earlier about the military service, I came through the fire service, went through an academy, and in that academy, I was taught process. I was taught you always put your turnout gear on and your air pack on the same way every time. It's process. And if we start breaking down our fundamental tasks in the field and the processes that are repeatable, it makes it very easy for the crew leader to manage. Now the crew leader knows what we expect as a company. They know what their people should be expecting from them because there's a process. And this doesn't need to be some micromanagement. We don't need to tell people how to set lines or how to put your climbing gear on. We're not talking about that detail of process. But a one-page, five to six bulletins maybe for how you want your day started. You know, maybe you want your crews coming in in the morning and they go meet with a salesperson or they go get the equipment ready. All right? And then they have this person checks off the fuel in the equipment. Maybe they have fueling at the end of the day or beginning of the day. But find out whatever process that you're wanting your crew leaders to do. Write it down. And then get feedback. Let them give you their feedback on why this process works or doesn't work. Then take that feedback that they've given you and build a process for the beginning of the day, the during the work day, and the end of the day. Start with those three things. Once we give those crew leaders that process, it gives them a frame and a structure. One thing we've realized in the world is too many choices makes a tyrant of us all. You know, if anybody here has a significant other and they ask that question, where are we going to go to eat tonight, it's always I don't know because there's too many choices. The same is true for our crew leaders. When we give them too many choices, they get locked into not making any choices. We need to give them the framework we wish them to work in, which is this process, break down the process into those five to six steps per thing, and then let them go achieve it. That way they know the goal they're trying to achieve, they know where you want them to get to, and how you want them to go about doing it. And then let it happen. And again, expect failure. It's going to happen. And when failure does occur, look at the process. Try to understand, was the process failed? Did we miss something in the process? Or did we just make a bad decision? Case in point, um, at our company, we use, we, you know, when we start chipping brush, we always place something under the rock tray on the bottom of the chipper where the clean out is at. And that's what we're supposed to do, and you know, that's what the manufacturer says to do. So we do that. Well, we use jet sleds. Anybody's ever bought a jet sled? They're pretty expensive, about $115 each. Well, I wanted to try something different. I said, you know what? I really don't want to spend the money on jet sleds for all these crews. We're going to go try to buy bus table trays. The bus boys use at restaurants. We're going to try to use that. So we bought all these bus trays. Crew leaders said, hey, you know, I'm not sure this is going to work. I said, yeah, it may, it may not. Let's give it a try. We tried it. Three days in, we realized it was a horrible decision, horrible idea we had that I had, and it didn't work. We looked at the process and said, hey, you know what? Our process is right, but our tool we put in the process was wrong. So we went out and bought all jet sleds. But we learned from that process. We learned from that failure, and failure is okay. What a lot of companies come back to me and hear, I hear from people is, well, our crew leaders are scared to make a decision. They're scared to make a choice. Well, they're not scared to make a choice. They're scared of failing. They're scared of what the outcome is going to be from you, the owner or their boss, if they fail. My opinion, failure is not a bad thing. Failure means you're trying something. If we don't ever try anything, you never get anywhere. So we need to let people be okay with failure. Let people understand failure is natural. And as long as we do it in a safe and controlled manner where nobody gets hurt, it's okay. You know, we have this myth out there that tree work is this, you know, efficiency, profitable thing. When in reality, the profit of tree work comes from not having incidents. But we only can learn from our mistakes if we allowed to make mistakes in a controlled fashion. So maybe you see, watch that guy putting on the chainsaw chain wrong. And instead of stopping him, you let him put the chainsaw chain on backwards. We've all done it. You let him go over and start cut, trying to start cutting on something. And then you walk over and say, hey, let's talk about this. Why did this happen? Why it's going on here? Use it as a learning moment when you make those mistakes versus a chance to chew somebody out for doing it wrong. That doesn't build a leader. A leader is built by process, repetition, and education. And we have to provide those things. But far too long we've seen le- crew leaders be put into positions that it's just because they're the climber or that they've been with the company the longest, and they're really not a leader. Some of our best leaders are people you wouldn't expect. People that just have that insight to see things. They see things differently. They see the problem. They see the solutions. All right? So before I go on, I want to open up to any questions real quick. 
So if anybody's got any questions, make sure you hit star six, and I'll get to your question, and we'll go from there. All right, well, no questions, so we're going to keep on moving forward. Um, again, if you guys – oh, we got one there. Came in last minute. Someone out of Toronto. Let's see what's going on in Toronto. Hey there, out of Toronto. Who, who's on? You got a question? Hello? All right, well, not sure what's happening, but I can't seem to hey, hear you. If you're sorry about now. that. Oh, there you are. Sorry. All right. My mute is still on. <laughs> That's all right. It uh, happens so, to all of us. Yeah, so, so um, just in regards to the leadership qualities that you were saying, um, sort of two questions. How do you identify those leaders or those born leaders, and, and what qualities do you look for in, in that person? Hey, that's a great question. What's your name, man? Josh. Say that again. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. It's Josh Keen. Josh? All right, Josh. Thank you very much. So Josh had a great question about qualities of a leader, the born leader, and how we do that, and how do we identify those qualities, and how do we go about finding those people. One of the best ways you can go about determining qualities of a leader is put people in leadership roles. Give them a chance to be in that leadership role. Maybe it's the new guy, and you don't want him to be necessarily the crew leader, but you want to put him in charge of saw maintenance. Find some role within that process that you can assign to somebody. Make it theirs. And how they go about handling that process will tell you if they're a leader or not. If somebody you know, always finds an excuse as to why they can't do saw maintenance, if that's their task that's assigned to them, probably not a leader. But if they find ways to make it work and they learn about it and they go about handling their business well, they probably got some good leadership qualities. The other thing you can do is there's a lot of testing online now um, that you can take. You sit first down in front of a computer for five minutes, answer some crazy questions about yourself. One of the tools out there is called Predictive Index. Um, it's literally five random questions. I did it. This thing hit me so well, it was scary what it told me about myself. That was right off of five questions. So there's some programs out there like that you can look into as well that you can do kind of some just standardized testing type stuff, real easy, nothing, nothing difficult, nothing hard, nothing scary. They can help you identify those, those born leaders, we'll call them. And then the question always comes up, well, what if I don't have any born leaders on my team? What if I just have a team that has no born leaders? That's okay. Leaders can be trained. Leaders can be built. There's a lot of great books out there on leadership on how to build leaders. But the core function of any leader is taking care of their people. It's taking care of their team and putting their team first. A true leader never puts himself first. They put their team first. When the team has successes, their team successes. When their team has failures, though, they're their failures. And I feel that's one of the big embodiments of a, as a leader is instilling that in your people. Of, hey, if something goes wrong, own it. There's nothing wrong with admitting you made a mistake. There's nothing wrong with owning the fact that, hey, you know what, it didn't go right. There was something honorable about that. Um, in, in the company I work with, we actually encourage that. Um, we encourage us to report all incidents. So it could be something as crazy as we had a guy last year put an outrigger pad of a bucket truck down and crush a little bit of an asphalt edge of a driveway. Not a big deal. But we reported it because we encourage that. We want people to own those things, not because they're going to be penalized for them, but because when we learn from those things, they should have put their outrigger pad down first. They didn't do that, and that's why it cracked it. It didn't displace the power and the energy. So those are some of the reasons of how we can go about identifying those things. But, Josh, that was a great question. Let's get to the next question. Well, there was a question up here, and it popped off. So if you just had sent your question in, send your question in again, because I did something that accidentally cleared you, so I apologize. Oh, there you are. All right. What's your question? And who is this? Hey, my name is Scott Klingerman. I'm in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. Hey, Scott. Uh, how you doing? So what's your right, question, Scott? My question Scott? would be... Uh, so we've got a couple guys. Uh, my question would be, I guess, uh, how would to inspire some of these guys to want to achieve more? You know, we see some qualities in some guys, but how do we kind of, so to speak, you know, light a fire or, or kind of get them to take the next step, of, you know, maybe to becoming a certified tree climber or a certified arborist or things of that nature? All right, let me ask you another question before I answer this question. Um, yes. In your company structure, do you have a structure of classification of worker, for instance, ground worker level one, level two, level three, climber level one, two, three? We do not. We're trying to work okay. on that and establish that, but at the point at this time, no, we do not. All right, <laughs> so that helps me out answering your question. All right, Scott, let me put you on mute here, and I'll see if I can get to your question and get it answered. All right, so Scott's question was how do we, you know, 
get people to want to move forward and push themselves to get to the next step and next level. One of my favorite quotes um, is from a guy named Colin Powell. You all might have heard of him. And it's about competition. And he says, competition breeds excellence in all. I'm a firm believer in making things competitive, and not necessarily in a competitive way of old-school dodgeball, getting singled out, last man picked, and getting beat with a little rubber ball, but making it competitive, making it where there's a ranking system of, you know, climber level one, two, and three, and everybody knows your level. Everybody knows if you're a climber level one, two, or three, or, you know, maybe you make a, a challenge of, hey, who can get their ISA certified arborist first, and maybe you create a reward system. A lot of companies, though, have gotten in trouble, not legal trouble, but cultural trouble within the company when they start incentivizing these things with pay. It turns into somebody just chasing money, and that's not what we want. We want people to chase that greatness inside them that comes from a strong culture. And that strong culture comes from being competitive, being open and honest about it, and just being real with people. Um, I think a lot of times we just throw money at our problems, especially when we're looking for good leaders and good climbers. We just throw money at them, and that doesn't bring you good climbers. It doesn't bring you good leaders. I've contracted all over the world. I've got a lot of really good friends that are contractors, way better climbers than me. Um, but what makes a good climber isn't how much money they make. It's how they handle themselves and how they, how they handle their mistakes and how they handle successes. So I think the best way to do this, Scott, is start having some competition, some friendly competition even. Maybe you set up, you know, if your work, throw line's an issue for you. Go hang a small tire or something in a tree and let people throw a throw line at it, you know. For whoever gets to throw the throw line in today gets – a paid lunch or something. I don't know. Find something silly and creative. You know, maybe it's new, new climbing gear. Maybe you're going to give away a treestuff.com, you know, gift certificate or something. Sorry, shameless plug. Um, but find ways to incentivize people, but make it competitive. When people start getting competitive with each other, it builds everybody else up. So hopefully that answers your question, Scott. Great question. What are the questions we have out there? Scott, out of in, Indianapolis, did that answer your question there, buddy? Yeah. Yeah, that did. Awesome, wonderful. Well, I'm glad I could answer it. Thank you. All right, well, if we don't have any other questions, we're going to move on. Uh, we'll talk about this leadership aspect. When we start talking about leadership, we have to understand when we're building leaders, there's two principles of a leader. And these principles can sound a little silly at first, but I'll explain them. First principle is it's only about you. And the second principle is it's never about you. So let me explain this. I know this sounds contradictory. It's only about you, meaning if you're going to expect other people to change, you have to change yourself first. So if you're in a leadership position now within a company and you're expecting other people to rise up to the occasion, to go to the next level, to be a better leader, you need to look at yourself first and how you're doing as a leader. You need to change those things that you want them to change themselves in you. You know, it's the guy who shows up on the job site that yells at everybody to put their PPE on as he's walking around with that helmet on. You know, that's not a good leader. So leadership is only about you, meaning you have to change yourself first before you can change others. Second point is it's never about you. The focus of leadership is never about you. The focus of leadership is about the team. The team is the aspect, and everything we do is a team sport. I'm a huge fan of sports, played football for many years, love sports. All right. On a Monday morning after Sunday NFL games, players make the paper if they win. Coaches make the paper when they lose. That's leadership, all right? So it's about the team aspect. When you have successes, you have successes as a team. But if there's failures, you have to own it as a, your failure. So the two biggest principles that we can instill in our crew leaders is it's always about them and how they change. And the change they want to see in others, they have to change themselves first. And then it's never about you, meaning you never promote myself over the team. Abraham Lincoln was quoted as saying, I can replace a 100 generals but I can't replace a 1,000 horses. I can make crew leaders all day long. I can assign the person the job title, put them in the position, increase their pay a little bit, but I can never replace the workers that they lead. And that's what that quote means. The leader is leading that workforce. It's leading your horses. So be careful in who you pick as your crew leaders, and if you pick the wrong crew leader, make a change. It's okay. It's okay that you have somebody in the position, you have a conversation and say, hey, you know, this isn't working. This isn't for you. This isn't what you're naturally suited at. That's okay. Not everybody's good at everything. All right? So make sure you understand those principles about crew leadership. Understanding crew leadership, one of your fundamental tasks is conflict resolution. Sometimes people just don't get along. It's okay. It's normal. We don't have to like everybody we work with, 
but we have to be able to work with everybody we work with. So one of the fundamental things that crew leaders deal with sometimes is that conflict resolution and how to handle that. The biggest f flaw we have in our system is that we don't resolve conflict. We don't talk about things. Um, the culture we live in nowadays, we don't talk about anything because we might offend somebody. The problem with that is when you have conflict in the crew dynamics, conflict that goes unresolved breeds more conflict. So encourage your crew leaders to resolve conflict in a correct manner. This is not a cussing, yelling, screaming match. It's sitting two people down, listening to both their sides, and making a good decision based on the information you're given. And also crew leaders need to know when to escalate the problem to upper management. They are not in charge of discipline. That's never what a crew leader should be in charge of. They should maybe be in charge of documentation of violation of company policy, safety procedures, those kind of things. Document it, turn it into somebody. But they should never be involved in the disciplinary action because once that crew leader becomes a disciplinarian of a crew, now they're seen as the police. And now you've lost any crew continuity you could have had. All right? And I don't mean any disrespect to police officers. That's not meant that way. What I mean, though, is we want crew leaders to be a crew, to be a team. If we're reporting and said, hey, man, you know, you're not wearing your safety glasses, there's a reason. We need to let people know that there's a reason why they should wear their safety glasses. Not because I'm getting you in trouble, but it's because I'm trying to help you and protect your eyes so you can go home and see your kids. All right? But you've got to document those things as a crew leader. But we don't want crew leaders doing discipline. That's where things kind of get off the rails pretty quickly. So we've got about eight minutes left in this session. I want to open this time up for any other questions we may have. Um, thank you again for letting me come sit here and talk. It's a kind of a unique experience. Um, I'm used to talking to a crowd that I can see. So I, I appreciate you guys listening to me on the phone. But what questions do we have out there that I didn't answer or that you want more information about? All right, got a question here. Hey, hey you're Travis. on. What's your question? Hey, Travis, I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to put this together. You know, it's, uh, I think there were a lot of really good pieces of content so far. I'm excited to hear what uh, other questions people have. But, um, you know, just getting this opportunity to sit down and listen to you and hear this in a little bite-sized nugget for 30 minutes tonight um, has really been nice. I'm not going to lie. I kind of thought this was going to be boring and uh, cause just because of the topic, right? I felt like I wasn't going to learn anything. But um, really, this has been great, and uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this, and I'm excited to listen to the next two calls as well. So I uh, just wanted to pipe in and say thank you. Oh, thank you very much. All right, next, next question. Hey there, uh, who is this? Uh, hi, uh, this is uh, Adam uh, in Eugene, Oregon. Hey, Adam, and, how you doing? Um, doing, doing fine. Um, feeling cooped up like most folks are at the moment. But, uh, <laughs> Under you know. Understandably. First world problems. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was just hoping you might be able to expand on, you know, the conflict resolution bit a little bit because, um, you know, most, you know, crews are working together pretty tightly um, and, you, you know, we got to work closely together. It's, you know, we got to watch out for each other, yada, yada. We all know this. But, like, so hypothetically say some conflict does come up uh, between two guys on your crew or, or girls, you know, whatever. But uh, to, um, how how do you, like, do you know any good strategies for diffusing, uh, you know, a conflict that, that might have come up and so everybody can, you know, uh, get yeah. on the same level and, and get back to work? Yeah, so I'll share one, one conflict resolution technique, um, and we'll see if that answers your question. So it's a, it's a great question, Adam, about conflict resolution and how we go about doing conflict resolution. There's lots of different ways to do it. The way I teach is the two-person method, which is where you have the people that are in conflict and then the crew leader. The crew leader is kind of that mediator, if you will. You listen to each person. So I listen to crew, crew person A. They tell me what their issue is. Then I listen to crew person B and what their issue is. All right? Then I have crew person A repeat back the issue crew person B is having and vice versa. I want to make sure they understand each other's point of view on the issue prior to making any decisions. So I, once we've done that, I said, okay. And then I kind of summarize, okay, so I understand that you don't like the way he cleans up and you don't think he cleans up well and you do all the work. Got it. All right. Find common ground is the last aspect. You explain, hey, we're all here together. We can all do a better job. If 
crew person A needs to rake more, and crew person B needs to spend less time on the chain or on the backpack blower. All right. So next job site, we're going to switch roles. Find that common ground, and then always finish with a handshake. There's something about a physical contact. Now, during the COVID-19 crisis, maybe a fist bump or maybe an elbow tap would be better than a handshake. But when you have physical contact, it breaks down the barrier of I'm mad at you. It's hard to be mad at somebody when you have physical contact. I mean, we're not talking about fisticuffs. We're talking about that good-hearted, hey, you know what? I see your side of it. I know you're frustrated. We're working for the common goal. This is where we're at. So that's one of the techniques I teach. Adam, hopefully that helped you. Um, see if we can get the next question here. <clears throat> All right, I believe Donald. Is that correct? Uh, it's actually Nels. Okay. Hey, man, how you doing? Pretty well yourself. Thanks, Thanks Travis. Um, Earlier you had mentioned some books on leadership. I just didn't know if you had any recommendations or not. Yeah, so books on leadership. Um, one of the books that I'm actually currently reading is called Tactics and Leadership. Um, it's by a guy named Jocko Link from U.S. Military. He was a Navy SEAL, uh, a commander in uh, the Chris Kyle. Everybody knows American Sniper, that whole story. He was his commanding officer. Um, great book by him. There's a few other good books out there. One of my favorites for the crew leader is a book called No Excuse Leadership. Um, it's all about having that approach to leadership of no excuses and owning it. Um, I've read it probably five or six times now. And then also, shameless plug, I have a book on Amazon on leadership. It's called Leadership for Today. That kind of talks about the crew leader aspect and the blue-collar worker aspect of leadership. So those are the three I'd go with, leadership and tactics, no excuse leadership, and then leadership for today. Hey, who's this? This is Brandon from Minnesota. Hey, Brandon, how you doing? Doing great. Uh, so, yeah, I got a question. So, at our company, we have kind of a structure where we do have kind of like a standard groundy one, two, three, climber one, two, three. So, that kind of classifies, I guess, your class of improvement. But as a crew leader, how can you identify improvement as a, as a crew leader, I guess, specifically on like things that you can actually track that are – other than stating day-to-day -day basis, like is there an actual kind of structure you could kind of do that's similar to that, I guess, if you have any examples of that? Or if you just do a monthly meeting with your, with your boss or salesman or whoever and then just kind of fill in things that you can improve on that other people have mentioned maybe? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Brandon, with the company structure you have, is very similar to the company structure that we run um, with its levels. And what I do with the crew leaders is I encourage my operations managers to set you know, quarterly goals for the crew leader and have weekly check-ins on how those goals are going. So maybe, the, you know, maybe they need to focus more on the paperwork aspect of the crew leader job. So we're going to you know, go for zero returned work orders coming back this quarter. And they check in weekly on how that's going. Maybe it's they need to do a better job of doing the tell, show, do technique of teaching on the job with teaching knots. We've got to set that as a goal. So we do quarterly goals for our crew leaders, and that's a good way we benchmark that progress because it is harder when you get to the soft skills of crew leader, but setting those goals is a good way to do that. All right, well, we're finishing up with the first session here. Um, you're more than welcome to stay on the call for the next session. Um, it's going to be some of the similar material, but you're more than welcome to stay on. We're going to take a quick little break and come back um, for the next session, but again, you're more than welcome to stay on, and in the meantime, I'll answer a few more questions. Hey there, who's hey, yeah, this? this is, hi, this is Allegra, um, and hey, Allegra. I was just I was just going to add to the list of books as well. If if you've heard of Dare to Lead by Brene Brown, um, oh, another good one. Yes, yeah, it's a really good one. Yeah, so I just wanted to add that to the to the list as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem. Have a great day.